Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, Gideon, finishing off the line of Gideon after having done the line of Jeroboam. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the way that you care for us, and the way you work in our lives, and um, we pray for each person who participates in these studies, that uh, your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, especially now in this time of Earth's history. We need your presence, Lord, in this study to correct us, to direct us, and to give us light for our feet, that we can um, find sure footing, that we can encourage those around us, and that we can lead others uh, to the celestial city. We pray, Lord, for this study in the book of Judges, um, how it speaks to us of our present situation. And we just pray, Lord, that we can understand it, and that we can share it with others. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, well, good morning again, everyone. So uh, the study that uh, we've been doing, uh, yesterday we, we addressed um, Succoth and Penuel. So we finished, uh, well, we affirmed uh, the understanding of these lines. And then we looked at Zeba and Zalmunna. And so when we dealt with Zeba and Zalmunna uh, previously, we had Zeba and Zalmunna uh, representing messages. And what were those messages? How did we do that? There was, there was a study of the Collins and um, um, Odilio. Right. So, so we have them being the studies of Colin and Odilio. And, and we had addressed that in line. So I'll just go here. Um, in this line here, um, chapter eight. So we had found all kinds of symbols that attach this to the 126, um, the 126 days, uh, that period of time. There was, um, now Penuel and Sukkoth, were different than the messages of, of Zeba and Zalmunna. So Zeba and Zalmunna represented the messages of Colin and Odilio. And we had um, them placed there December 25th. So that was Judges 8, verse 4 to 7. And then Judges 8, 20 um, was, was the message of Odilio on February 12th. 2022. So we had Colin's message, December 25th, 2021. It's the line at the bottom there. I maybe could zoom in a bit so people can see this. Oops. That's not zooming in. There we go. So, um, so you can see that better there. And we had it where um, Penuel ends up coming before Sukkoth. So this was the events uh, dealing with what happened on October 2nd, 2021, regarding uh, the conversation with Daniel Fontenot and Mark Johnson. Colin was a little bit there too, but uh, he was claiming, they were claiming things regarding amalgamation what it meant in the spirit of prophecy and how that related to uh, uh, the vaccine and things like that, which we rejected, these conspiracy theories. Um, and then on December 25th, 2021, Colin's going to present his study on Trump. And then 49 days later, uh, Adilio is going to present his study uh, dealing with the candidates. And we can see that this symbol is in other lines as well. Patrick, uh, yeah, there, okay. 
Um, sorry about that. I'm trying to trouble muting someone. Um, and so we had uh, Penuel and Sukkoth representing these conflicts that occurred. That is the conflict with the American group and the conflict with the Canadian group. And um, so here we have Penuel and Sukkoth mi mixed with Zeba and Zalmuna. And if uh, and and also we have Jether there, which we're not addressing here in this study. Um, and he said unto Jether his firstborn, that's eight twenty, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Then Ziba and Zamuna said, rise thou and fall upon us. So it's actually beyond that. So it starts at Judges 8.20, dealing with Jether, and then Ziba and Zalmuna, those messages. Um, so they're going to be killed. Gideon rose and slew Ziba and Zamuna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Right, and then they're going to have Gideon's ephod that's going to be, to be made. So... So I don't want to go back over this study, but I want to just mention here that in this study, when we address this, uh, Penuel and Sukhoff represented these groups, the American and Canadian group, and their lack of support for Gideon pursuing Zeba and Zalmuna. So Zeba and Zalmuna are these messages of Colin and Odilio, but What's the problem with the message? Because these are messages from God. We recognize that Ziba and Zalmuna, that is the messages of Colin and Odilio, are from God. In Ziba and Zalmuna, uh, what, what is the problem? What is the problem with Colin's presentation and Odilio's presentation? Even though we believe that there's this, this is the chronology here is given of God, what's, what's the particular problem? How can, how can we take something that is from God, but also see it as a message that's being pursued and that needs to be defeated? The conclusion of it. Conclusion of them. Okay, so there's the conclusion, but why does that conclusion exist? Probably lack of maybe understanding. Okay, so there's a lack of understanding. And what is it that they don't understand? Well, uh, one is Xerxes and the other one is Psychos. Uh, okay, so it's not so much that 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 they have a under, lack of understanding of the symbols. I mean, we know that Xerxes. Uh, you know, isn't Trump, it is Trump, but Alexander is not Trump, right? So Xerxes is Trump. Xerxes is, you know, Alexander cannot be Trump resurrected. Right. It's Greece, right? Yeah. Now, okay. But the real problem is understanding the lines themselves. Right? They haven't taken the time to go through and examine the foundation so this is something that we did over a period of, of more than two years right starting on march 7th uh, 2021 we began to examine the foundation and, and examining the foundation was important so that when uh um colin presented his views and adilio his views we could already see that there was something they didn't grasp, and that was the mistakes of white history. But up to speed on it. Yeah. So then we began examining or, or understanding the lines. So we started going through the lines on December 26th, 2021. So we start going through the lines, and, and that gives us even further light to understand um, the problem that we have in this movement. So the problem we have is, well, it's a lack of understanding of the lines, but also we're not converted. And so 
if we're not converted, we can't understand the truth because, and in a sense, it's our lack of conversion that causes us to have pride and so forth and not look at things um, that we need to look at and examine because they reveal that there's a problem with us and we don't like doing that because we're human beings who are sinful. So none of this is a justification of, of any person, right? Understanding the truth does not justify a person. None of us are better than anyone else. This is not a competition between people. So, so that's what happened when we looked at uh, the line of judges, or the line of chapter eight of judges. Uh, we could we could look at Penuel and Sukkoth in that manner. So when we uh, dealt with this yesterday, and we dealt with the line of Gideon, we also have Sukkoth and Penuel. But in this line, um, this line of Gideon. We're saying that um, this is not about Sukkoth in, in their lack of support. This is about the symbolism of the punishment that um, uh, the princes of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel receive. So with Sukkoth, they're going to be beaten down, right? And we're connecting this to the bombing of Nashville on December 25th. So they're going to be thrashed. Um, and we looked at the, the words there that are used. We could see that that could represent uh, the bombing of Nashville. And then tearing down the tower, uh, that's Penuel. And that's going to be January 6th. And we also connected this to these 100 days of prayer and the 10 days of prayer. And to this whole structure of the 777 being divided by 433 days and 343 days. Um, and we also... Uh, looked at the dream, right? So we know that this uh, dream uh, that's in the first message uh, helped us understand a little bit more about how this line is developing. And so this line primarily is about what? What did we decide that this line is about? About. Because we still always have a hard time, you know, defining exactly what the darkness is and then what the messages are. Do we have a way in which we can explain this simply and why this happens with the line of Gideon? Because then we're going to get to the third angel arriving. So does anybody have... Is there anybody who has a good way to explain this line? If you were going to explain it to somebody and you say, we have this line of Gideon and you're going to explain the darkness, what it is, and you were going to explain what the first message was and what the second message is. Could you do that? So there's no one able to do this. Isn't this situation with Gideon very much like that of Joseph? Okay. Uh, explain. Well... In the situation with Joseph, you have a young man that is placed into darkness, but retains his faith in what God is doing. He is given a dream while he is yet not in an optimum situation. Mm -hmm. Now, he was placed in this, in this situation because his father had sent him on a mission to check on his brothers. Mm -hmm. Now, there were two brothers that 
had issue one having issues with his with the other brothers and one being the instigator of selling Joseph into captivity. That we said no Judah did that. Well, isn't Judah the one that, that came back to rescue him? That was Reuben. That was Ru that was Reuben. Well, Reuben came back and wanted to rescue him. Or you're talking about, yeah, Judah decides to sell him into uh to the Ishmaelites. Now, in a sense, that was they didn't want him killed. But uh, was it well, okay, but wasn't Simeon the instigator of the the issue? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's that Simeon, but he's not the one wanting to sell him. I uh, thought he was. Uh, no, Judah's the one that sells him. So, uh, and right, so. So remember, it's it's in Genesis thirty-seven twelve. Here, I'll just share this. Let's go over this and make sure that we understand this correctly. His brethren went to feed their flock, father's flocks, in Shechem. So one is we have Shechem here, um, um, which we know that Shechem is that area between, uh, um, so the men of. So it's the men of Shechem. So they were dressing the men of Shechem, right? Okay. Or, or not the men of Shechem. I always get those two mixed up. Shechem is between the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of uh, of Cursing, right? Right. Yeah. So that's where we are. So, so they're in that area. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed thy flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto said to him, here I am I. Right. So he's going to a go, right? He's going to see whether they be, it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And certain found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him saying, what seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed thy flock, their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence, right? So he has to go down to Dothan. And then they said, here comes this dreamer. And Reuben heard it and delivered. So um, so here it is. Yeah, Reuben's going to deliver him out of the hands of his brethren. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him in some pit. And we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto him, Shed no blood, but cast him in this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him that he, he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben is going to save him, right? Reuben wants to, wants to redeem himself and save Joseph, yes. Yeah. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat and his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked. Behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother? and conceal his blood. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. So Judah's the one that suggests they sell him to the Ishmaelites. Uh, I don't see Simeon in here. So, okay, if, if you were to go to third spiritual gifts. Okay, so it's not here in the Bible, it's, it's in the spirit of prophecy. Correct. Okay. It's it's going to occur just a little bit later than the portion that you're looking at in Genesis. So you're saying it's uh, it's mentioned in the Bible in this section? I, I don't know mm -hmm. that it is mentioned in the Bible, but the action that I'm looking at is going to be mentioned a bit later. 
Yeah, isn't that when they when Joseph is in Egypt and dealing with uh, uh, the meal with his brothers? No, it's when it's after that because as as three spiritual gifts, one fifty seven reads, and you'll find this also in Spirit of Prophecy. Yeah. Joseph selected Simeon to be bound because he was the instigator and principal actor in the cruelty of his brethren toward him. Okay. Yeah. So it's in connection with that whole encounter with the brothers. It's not right. mentioned in the scripture per se, other than that we're going to have this uh, situation with his brothers when Joseph tests his brothers. But right. it doesn't, doesn't explicitly tell us why Simeon is chosen. Correct. Right. So Alan White provides that information. Okay. But yeah, we know it's Judah who actually sells him into slavery. Now. Right. And that's why the joining of the two sticks in Ezekiel 37 has one stick for Judah. Right. And one stick for Ephraim or Joseph. Right. Okay. So is this line with Gideon, with, with Gideon, a type of a chiasm with what happened with Joseph. I don't know what you mean, a chiasm. Why do you use the word chiasm? I use it a lot. I know, uh, but okay, but it's a chiasm. There's no chiasm that I see. It's a parallel. All right. Okay. Because I was I was looking at the actions of the brothers at the beginning in the in the in that portion of the story with Joseph. And then I'm looking at the actions on this situation with Sukkoth and Penuel at the end of this situation with Gideon. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's a chiasm. Okay. These are so just parallels. Uh, I mean, a chiasm, you would have to have a structure that would, would give us that. And I don't see that. Okay. I, I think of as chiasm always as a structure. All right. Um, but you know, that's, that's how I understand a chiasm. So I, I don't see that here, but what we can't, what we do have is a parallel. Okay. And, um, now, cause we already attached the story of Joseph here because of the dream. Right. Right. Now this would be the dream of the Butler and Baker in the sense of it's a dream. It's not Joseph's dream. It's not really Pharaoh's dream. It's a dream that that's interpreted. And the first dream that really is interpreted by Joseph of somebody else's dream is the dream of the butler and baker. Right. So we have that dream. Now here, this dream isn't interpreted by Joseph or by Gideon. It's interpreted by somebody in the camp itself, one of the Midianites. So he hears of this dream and, 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 Gideon hears this dream explained and the interpretation of it explained. So it ties us to the story of Joseph in the idea of this dream. Right. That's how we looked at it. And, and so the significance there that it's a dream had to do with its waymark as a formalization. So this is this is connected with this first message, this dream. Okay. So, so this dream is an understanding, um, because if we if we look at the story of Joseph, uh, the time of the end is when Joseph has his two dreams, and then the formalization is going to be connected with also this prediction before midnight. So we had it. Uh, the symbol of this was the prediction before midnight. If we remember the study that Tabo had done, that blessings had done. So we had this, uh, the three days symbolized the prediction before midnight. And Tabo had tied those three days to the three days at the river Ahava. And we used this as a symbol of the prediction before midnight back in 2017. But really it's the formalization of a message. And uh, so we have this message the time of the end, the message arrives in Joseph's two dreams. It's formalized in the dream of the butler and baker, and it's empowered in the two dreams of Pharaoh. And then when 
Joseph's dreams are fulfilled when his, his brothers arrive and they bow down before him. That's the arrival of the second angel's message. Right? Because then it's it's fulfilled. Right. And and we never really dealt with that line too much, but either either the formalization is um you know connected to that story. So that would be having to do with uh um when the father comes, and then you also have its empowerment. So, so I'm not really sure. Patrick, you're, I can't mute you for some reason. Can you mute your mic? I can't mute you. I'm not sure why I can't. But we're getting lots of noise there. There we go. Okay. And, um, I mean, and so we could probably go back and look at that line of Joseph again. But in that line of Joseph, that's at least that first part. We can see the arrival, the formalization, and the empowerment of that message with these dreams. All of those are the, the two dreams of Joseph, the dreams of the butler and baker, and then the two dreams of Pharaoh. That's all the first angel's message in the story of Joseph, in the line of Joseph. So, so we can see that here that this is connected, that there's symbolism connected with the story of Joseph and this line. Now, when it comes to uh, Sukkoth and Penuel, um, these are judgments, right? So these are judgments uh, that come upon uh, these messages. And, and so they symbolize something external that is, December 25th, 2020 is Nashville. January 20, January 6th is uh, the United States connected with that July 4th, right? So the 187 days. It's like a day of atonement. And that is the biblical date on January 6th, 2021 is October 22. That is, it's not October 22, but it's the 22nd day of the 10th month on the biblical calendar. And so it's, it's that date, right? It's a, it's a day of atonement. So we can see that 187 days for the United States is a symbol of the first day of the first month being July 4th and the 10th day of the seventh month being January 6th, 2021. And we connect this to Trump, right? To the Trump prediction. So Trump loses this battle. This is a battle between the North and the South the North being Republican and the South being Democrat. And so Trump loses to the King of the South and in a line that is not on the big line, but in a line, we can say that this is raffia, right? That is raffia has different places and different lines as symbols. So there is a line in which this is raffia. January 6th is raffia. It's not the raffia that we call midnight on that bigger line, that's something still future. This is, a, this is a typification of that. And that's the tearing down of the tower. And so we can see that that symbolizes uh, what's torn down is this tower. So what is this tower that's torn down January 6th? What is a tower? Can it not be a, um, I mean, an understanding? Okay. Now, but a tower usually is used to watch. Right. right. Can we connect the tower to the Constitution? Yes. Okay. So, in a sense, that's what happens on January 6th. The Constitution is overridden. Now, according to the media, you know, there was an insurrection going on and everything was done properly in order from the side of, you know, the government, so to speak, and what it did, uh, you know, charging all these people and so forth. But really, uh, we could see that the Constitution had been overridden. Maybe not in the particular letter of it, 
but in the spirit of it. It had definitely been set aside. Yeah. So this was really about politics, not about principle. I mean, the principle was there seemed to be irregularities in, in the election, and the government should have addressed all of those things. If you had an open uh, government that was concerned about the integrity of the government, everything would have been exposed and clear to make sure that there was no irregularities. But instead, uh, we had this party politics going on, um, which which really underrides or undermines the the principles of the Constitution of free and fair elections, right? We, I mean, right. not all of us really know the truth about what happened because you have two extreme views and we just don't know enough. Things weren't open enough. So it has created a distrust in the government, in the media, where if they actually care cared about uh, the government, they cared about the, the principles, they would have done things quite differently. But this was politics, not, and politics is policy, right? Correct. Not principle. So, so with the Republicans being defeated there, um, definitely it's a setting aside of the Constitution. And the United, it's the end of the United States in the context of these lines. Trump is the last president of the United States. Well, it's it's in in what we've been looking at from from history and from what's shown in the Bible. This was also the end of the Medes and the Persians. Um, okay, so you're saying um, how are so you're saying that when the Persians are defeated by the by Greeks. Greeks. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because there there is parallels within Greece as well, because you have the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, in this right. case, you know, Persia is not the king of the north or the king of the south. I mean, this is more east and west when it comes to Greece and Medo-Persia. Um. We don't have the North and South system set up at that time. But you can see the defeating of Trump by the um, uh, by the Greeks, right? That that's symbolically represented when Xerxes is defeated. Right. So later on, then you're gonna have Alexander the Great. And and the idea that Jeff had initially is that Alexander also represented Trump in charge of the United Nations. But as we continued to study, we, we came to realize that Trump is not Alexander. Right? Because he's not a globalist. He never has been. Yeah, he never has been a globalist. And, and he's not going to become a globalist because he believes in the Constitution. It's, it's basically his modus operandi is, um, and his basic principle that he lives by is, is this sort of competitive American spirit that the individual needs the freedom to, ever, to do whatever he wants to do to become successful. So Trump's not a racist. He's not, uh, uh, um, you know, he doesn't hate women. He's obviously not a moral person. Right. But he doesn't show prejudice towards people by based on race or or sex. Right. So he doesn't he promotes women. He does has no problem with women being successful. Which is it's just to me, it's always made no sense to say that Trump's a, a racist. You know, he's never demonstrated it. And and the left never, ever saw him as a racist until he ran for president. They used to love Trump when he was a Democrat, you know, so, and he didn't change. He just recognized that he wanted America to continue. And so he chose, just excuse me for a second here.
it's always been interesting to me <clears throat> how much Trump was really loved by really all parties and how much his influence was sought for so many years by all parties. And yet when he came out being very vocal and very direct about America first, how he was then being reviled by those that have held power for so very long. So part of what Theodore is getting at there is that there, there have been issues and we're seeing people's ultimate characters, especially in the politicians, we're starting to see these characters okay. being revealed. Okay, Dwight, we'll go over that again. I just, I had put the recording on pause, so. No problem. Okay, so, so we're going to resume. What okay. I was, what, what I was saying is that for so many years, Trump was being courted by so many different factions and that he was respected. And these people all wanted his influence, but ultimately they wanted his money. Now, when he came out and he's being very, very direct about America first, now he's being reviled as being something that is <clears throat> completely different from their way of thinking and they they don't want his thinking to permeate America. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So if we're going to deal with um, this being Penuel, January 6th, um, we know that it's Raphael. We, get, we bring it back to the Battle of Raphia, yes. And we know in this line um, that you wouldn't have to have a Paneum as well, or wherever this is Raphia, um, you need you need Paneum. So now it's not really this line, right? Because we're placing it there, January 6th, as Penuel. But in this line, we're not calling it Raphia, if, if you understand what I'm saying. It is Raphia in some line. Does that make sense? It's Raffia in some line, correct. Yeah, but not this line particularly. Okay. Because this line is not addressing that. But but we can see that January 6th has these attributes of the end of the United States. That is, it has to do with the Constitution, this this tower that's that's broken down. And Succoth deals with Nashville, the, the bombing there. So we can see that these two symbols, Succoth and Penuel, are this formalization and this empowerment of a message. And that message is the message of July 18, where the 300 are crossing the Jordan, faint yet pursuing. That's Judges 8 verse 4. So... So if we're going to you know, support this line, this second message, this second message is, is addressing the failure of July 18. But we're pursuing Zeba and Zalmuna. And Zeba and Zalmuna are messages that is, we're trying to understand Trump, why, why the, the Trump prediction appeared to fail because Trump's supposed to be the last president. So we still have that. And then also the Nashville prediction, what's going to happen with Nashville. So it doesn't happen right on July 18th, but when we have Nashville's not attacked by Islam on July 18th, in this movement, we have these questionings going on. So we have an increase of knowledge that is occurring. And, and then Trump is going to lose the election. And so in this movement, we have people studying, uh, we're studying Daniel chapter 11, verse one to four. And then FFA is going to say, well, on December 6th, you know, we can't use chronology. And some of them are saying, if Trump loses this election, you know, we're, we're out of this message, right? 
the whole message was a failure. And I, I, I believe that was Larry, uh, Larry Hine who said that, if I remember correctly, in one of the studies. Just said, yeah, if, if Trump if Trump loses, then you know everything we did was wrong. Remember that. Yeah. So so what happens on December 25th, 2020? We have here um, now December 25th, 2020, there's going to be this um, So what happens on December 25th, 2020? That's going to be the, the bombing of Nashville, right? So how does that relate then to, to what, what happened on December 6th? Now, we don't have December 6th in this line, this line particularly. But we have the failure. Of Trump loses this election. We don't have January 6th yet. But Trump has lost the election. By December 25th, 2020, I mean, there's... Obviously, some people who think that Trump still might become uh, president, right? right. The bombing of Nashville. So we're saying that this this represents a formalization of the message. Because when we see the bombing of Nashville, we know that that in the line of Jeroboam, that's going to be the 187 days from. So this is just the above. We're going to have the 187 days from June 21st and June 22nd when that Nashville prediction is published and goes worldwide, right? So, so we have that there in, in the line of Jeroboam. In the line of Gideon, we go to this line, we have December 25th, 2020 there. Um, but the 187 days marked here is going to be from the July 4th date. And, and so when we look at the Jeroboam and Gideon line, they're very similar, but they have differences. And, and this line here, primarily, it says that it's testing two groups, FFA and the refuse or the remnant of FFA. All right. Now, we don't have that particularly in this line. We didn't put that two groups that are being tested. Because this line tends to be... Uh, more of an external line, right? We, we look at March 27th as related to the pandemic. We look at July 4th related to the United States, uh, the prediction of Nashville, and then what happens in Nashville, and then what happens to the United States. So now we have Sukkoth here. This is dealing with the prediction regarding Nashville. So we're saying that that more relates to Odilio's study and the Trump study, January 6th, that relates more to Colin's study. So these are not, Colin's study um, hasn't happened yet, you know, but it's based on this, if, if you understand what I'm saying. So what happens January 6th? Colin's study then is a result of that. He's trying to say, well, nothing happened uh, regarding what we thought was going to happen with Trump. We thought he would still be president. And so Colin has a study near, nearly a year later. It's going to be uh, uh, 350, 54 days later, something like that, that Colin's then going to have this study um, after January 6th, 350 or I think it is, or 53. Anyway, it's, it's a, a biblical year later that you're going to have that. So, so what does this mean then? We have this line and we have this message. So what is the second message? Because we can look at the way marks, but we have a hard time defining what these messages are. Okay, so what's the darkness in this line of Gideon? 
We have a darkness and we have a time of the end. So what's the darkness again? It, we, we said it was the darkness of, of Adventists regarding Nashville. Dwight had suggested that it has to do with a rejection of the spirit of prophecy. Right. So, so we're not interested in this Nashville prediction. Is, is there more to it? I think there is quite a bit more. Okay. But we're gonna have to we're gonna have to delve into this together. So when the church as the church has continued, we're finding ourselves more and more that many of the admonitions of the spirit of prophecy are either being set aside or they're being hidden. The situation regarding Nashville was not something that was widely addressed really until, <clears throat> until we started studying and Elder Jeff started approaching these things. Yeah. So there's, there's quite a bit that we need to have accepted, especially in the admonitions of the spirit of prophecy, so that we are keeping and worshiping in line with what God would have us to do. Okay, now regarding Nashville itself. So when we first had July 18 as an attack by Islam on the United States. We didn't have Nashville. Like in November of 2018, um, when I brought out July 18th at the School of the Prophets. Um, and we did it two different ways. First through Ezekiel, the 10th day of the fifth month, and then through uh, Revelation 9 uh, uh, to become the 26th day of the fourth month. So we had two different July 18 dates. First, we had the Julian date, then the Gregorian date, 13 days apart. But we still didn't have Nashville. And I remember Odilio writing me and ask, asking me where I thought the attack would be. And I just said Nashville, because I knew about Ellen White's Nashville vision. Now, I knew about it prior to... Uh, the release of um, the letters and manuscripts because it is in Ellen White's writings. It's not just in the letters and manuscripts. Right? Well, I think you have her writing that in Nashville. She says, while, while I was in Nashville, I had this yeah. vision. So, but right. it wasn't until my script for a late. She said uh, the actual fireball settled in Nashville. Right. So the settled in Nashville is in the manuscripts. Um, so in a book called The Great Visions of Ellen G. White, uh, this book was published. quite a long time ago, and I'm just trying to see if I can find it here. Uh, but uh, um, I think it's in this book here. It's going to have uh, just don't know the page but anyway it's it's in this book that they're going to describe uh ellen white's vision right and uh, they don't have all of the manuscripts but they take this vision as being uh, a nuclear attack on nashville so um 
Let's see if I can find this here. This isn't going to help me too much. So, so I don't just think it's in 2015. Anyway, the point is that we know about Nashville. We have books published about Ellen White's writings where people are aware of, of this, um, this vision, right? So it's just that we get all of the, all of her statements released in 2015. And it's the settled in Nashville. That's the, the one phrase um, that comes out. I'm trying to find this here. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's manuscript one eight eight nineteen oh five. And so so even on the internet, we know about this. I mean, there's so many places prior to two thousand fifteen. Uh, that this is um, discussed. And even that statement, even though it's not on the Ellen White disc, it's still known, even the settled in Nashville statement. Because uh, I'm looking here at, uh, trying to find the date of this. This is the E.G. White Estates. Um, so this is uh, where they're, addressing false statements, but they, they use how that this statement here, uh, the judgment of gods in our cities on July 5th, 1906, issue of the Review and Herald. Um, so it represents that. So that's where we would no, normally know it from, is that uh, Review and Herald article. Um, um, so anyway, I, I don't have all the references right here. But we can say generally that the church is not interested in this Nashville prediction of Ellen White's. Neither is uh, most of the movement. Yeah. So, so this movement, we, we pick up the Nashville prediction in connection with July 18. That is, at some point... And it's going to be early in 2019, that when we're examining July 18th and this date, we attach Nashville to it. And that was correct in doing so. That is, the symbolism is all there, uh, connecting uh, Ellen White's vision to Nashville. And we believe that, that, that it would have occurred if it was not for the warning. And Jeff had applied um, uh, the story of Jonah and the warning uh, to Nineveh, right? So was Jonah a false prophet because uh, Nineveh wasn't destroyed in 40 days? No. No. So, And Jeff had applied that to us having to give this warning. And if we thought about the parallel, that means if the warning's given, then the event is going to be delayed. Now, we would say, well, people didn't repent. But, but people did repent. That is, there are people that we know of that took this warning seriously. And for whatever reason, you know, there's a lot of reasons. One is this movement wasn't ready. But we don't know all the stories of everything that happened and how that that warning affected people so it is delayed what's 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 going to happen to nashville could have happened on july 18th but it's been delayed 
So, so this first message then, so if we're looking at the darkness, the darkness has to do with this Nashville prediction, but it has to do with the spirit of prophecy and the understanding of the spirit of prophecy in relation to the events that are coming. Now, remember, Ellen White also talks about September 11th in Testimonies 9-11, right? So in Testimonies 9-11, we're going to have September 11th. But we know that 11-9 is also 9-11. So the darkness that's happening here in this line is a fractal of what's happening in the big line, right? It is, we're zooming into the arrival of the second angel with the book of the Judges. We're zooming into September 11th. And the line of Gideon is the empowerment of that. And we can see how this whole thing dealing with the Nashville prediction, July 18th, is an empowerment of the arrival of the second angel, which has to do with the Sunday law. And we have in this history, we have the pandemic, which is a type of the Sunday law. And we have the Civil War from Ellen White's vision, right? So from the start of the Civil War to the Battle of Manassas, that 100 days, and then the 13 days from the Battle of Manassas to Ellen White having her second vision, which talks about the Battle of Manassas and how there was an intervention. Right. So we can see that in this whole line is tied up all of these symbols that are on the bigger line. But they're here typically. So when we zoom into a waymark, the empowerment of the first angel on the line of the judges, we're going to get this line. We're going to get other lines, too, because we get uh, each of the three lines of the three chapters. We get the line of Jeroboam, and then we get the line of Gideon. But the darkness here particularly has to do with this Nashville prediction. In its parallel to September 11th, that is, it's a judgment upon the cities of the United States. And we can see that here with Sukkoth and Penuel in the second message. So in the first message, we're going to have this pandemic, right? So all of those things that Jeff talked about, when he talked about Rafi and Paniam in January 14th of of 2017 and we, we had come to understand daniel 11 that it's 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 much uh uh there's all these repeats of history in that line of daniel 11 that it repeats these these lines it repeats these battles of the kings of the north and the kings of the south and that what happened in 1989 wasn't the end of that battle so so the darkness then has to do with these judgments of God upon the United States. That's an Adventism does not understand these things. We put them off as something that happens, you know, way after the Sunday law or something like that, right? Just when Jesus comes back. But we know there are events that, that wouldn't be meaningful if they were happening just at the second coming, correct? Agreed. So these judgments have to come before. And Adventists don't want to talk about that because they just want this idea that there's the Sunday law that comes and the Sunday cut law comes, the church makes it stand. We give this message to the world and then probation closes. And then, you know, we're protected from the plagues. You know, as long as we stay with the, with the ship, with the church, you know, we all be fine. So, so you don't need to panic about anything. You don't need to worry about anything. Just stay asleep until we tell you to wake up. And, and so what happened on November 9th, 1989, the church didn't seem to think it was a, a prophetically significant event. And what happened on September 11th, 2001, the church didn't seem to think it was a, a prophetically significant event. Right? So the church has passed by. So we get to 11.9, and now we have this movement that is addressing these issues, has been addressing these issues all along. But now this movement is going to go through an experience that's typical of what's going to happen. So 
So, so this darkness has to be this darkness, this lack of understanding of what's coming upon the United States. And so we're going to get a pandemic. We're going to get um, this bombing of Nashville. It's typical, right? And then we get the siege of Washington. And, and all through that history, too, don't you have the BLM riots in early 2020, right? Correct. So, so we have all of this civil unrest. We have a civil war in the United States. And that civil war is still going on. Now, Colin's message has lots of things in it that we need to understand and study. The problem is, is it doesn't recognize the mistakes that were made in Millerite history, what they mean as far as the mistakes that we're making. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't understand the lines themselves and how they're typical lines. And that what we're going through as a movement What's necessary is for this movement to become united. That is, we have to be converted because that's the only way that we can be united so that we can complete the work that we've been given to do. And so right now, when we look at this, this line of Gideon, this is about July 18th, but it's about July 18th in the context of this movement. It's witnessed to by external events. It's witnessed to by the civil unrest, right? The pandemonium, the pandemic, right? Those are things that Jeff talked about on January 14th, uh, 2017. There was all kinds of other pans. I can't remember all the list of pans that he had, but this is something universal, right? This is something that's, that's worldwide that's going on right now. Um, you know, for young people growing up with this, they might just think this is normal, but this is definitely what we have seen, you know, with Trump being elected and all the events that happened in 2020 with the pandemic and up to the present time. These are unprecedented in our lifetime. You know, obviously, this starts really with 9-11. Um, I mean, that was a shock. Came suddenly and unexpectedly. But so did this pandemic. So we're caught up in, in all of this fulfilled prophecy, and we have to sort through it and understand it. And the only way that we can do that is with these lines. So this line here, we need to understand what all of these events mean. And we see that, that we have these, um, these way marks or these symbols that we can look at the ju judges and the story of Gideon, and we can place them. But it's not just about what's happening now. It's about what's going to happen. Right, because Nashville is going to happen. A civil war is going to occur. The United States is going to be in greater turmoil in the future than it is presently. Now, the belief that, that many people have is that the Sunday law is imminent. The one thing we can say is that the Sunday law is not imminent. That is, it's not going to happen this year or next year. Can we say that with confidence that it's not going to happen based on what we study in these lines? And if we say that, are we giving a peace and safety message? Anybody want to answer those questions? It's a warning message to get ready. At this point, 
we have a message that's going to have to go first to the leadership, then through the temple, and then through Jerusalem. So I would almost have to say that first these messages have to go out and once the message of warning has gone out, then the Sunday law could occur. Okay. So if we think that the Sunday law is imminent and we haven't given the warning, then we would have to say that our movement is insignificant and doesn't really have anything to do with end time events. Well, right. it's not just that the movement is significant, insignificant. It is that the movement is not correct in its in the way that it's approaching things. Right. Right. So, so yeah, if we think that the Sunday law is coming and we haven't done our job and all the things that we say need to happen, we're just going to set them aside, then we would have to say that the movement was in error. See, if in, in this situation, <clears throat> if we are not being prepared to give a message, then we are stuck in what we've seen in Ezekiel 8, and we are not prepared for Ezekiel 9. Yeah. Okay, so if it's true that the Sunday law is not imminent, as we're saying, we're not giving a, a, a peace and safety message. Actually, it's quite the opposite. All right. Because we're saying to this movement that the Sunday law is not imminent because we are not united. We haven't done our work. And it would be peace and safety to just say the Sunday law is imminent. That would be peace and safety. Because it's saying we don't we don't have any preparation to make now. We're okay. We've done our job when we haven't done our job. I don't think I would say that. Okay, I, what do you I, I, I wouldn't put say that it's not going to be happening in the next couple of years. Well, we know it's not going to happen in the next couple of years. Unless the movement does its job, right? You would agree that we have to do our job first before the Sunday law comes. Right, Rosanna? Can the Sunday law come before we do the work that we've been given to do? It's going to be rapid, he said. Okay. But you're, you, you agree that we have to do our work first before the Sunday law comes? Yes. Okay. And, and we haven't done it yet? No. Yeah. Okay. So, so we know we have to do it. And now it could be that when this camp meeting comes this summer, that the movement comes together, something happens and, and we become united and we go forth and do our work. But what's being suggested right now is that the movement is in fine shape. That there is no division in the movement, that the movement is in agreement and it's just me and a few others who um, are the problem, right? So we're actually the problem. And that, you know, we just need, to, they're just going to keep waiting. Trump's going to come back into power. Originally, it was going to be in, in 2022. Now they're looking to 2024, right? And that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law, right? So that's, that's the view. And so we don't have anything really to do. We're just waiting. Sunday law is going to come. But are we doing anything? Are we warning anyone? Are we doing anything to, to bring, to organize some kind of warning to the church first? We just seem to be talking to ourselves. So if it's going to be 
in 2024, well, we're not doing anything about it. And we see all the things that have to occur. So the Millerites made these mistakes as well. They set aside what they believed had to occur. And, and we saw this even after October 22, 1844. They kept looking for Jesus is just going to come back. But that's not how it works. You don't just you don't just wait, you know, for events to happen. You have a warning message to give. And right now we're focused upon understanding the message for ourselves and then our responsibility and how we're going to give that message. So we don't even know what the message is that we have to give. I mean, we do, but we don't. Because the message that the Canadian, the American group seem focused upon is we're going to give a message that Trump is going to become president and he's going to bring in the Sunday law. And we think that if Trump becomes president again, then people are going to listen to us. If Trump became president again, would anybody be listening to us based on that? No. And why not? Right now, there's so many others that are that are looking for Trump to come back into power that this would not be anything special. Right. Would be nothing special. We're just giving the same thing that the world is giving. The evangelicals are giving that message. Right. Lots of people are giving the message, both from a positive and a negative point of view. Right. So, so yeah. Yeah. In, in this situation, can we tie in Ellen White's train station vision? Okay, so the train, train station vision, again, can you go through that? Because Jeff applied it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mrs. White is standing at a train platform. She sees wheat ready for harvest. And all of a sudden, everything just becomes flat. There's no, you, you see nothing. It's almost like everything has been decimated. Okay. Now, here and there, eventually you begin to see Adventists standing up. But it's not a huge number it's just a few one here one there now yeah. in this in this type of situation i've had to look at this that this is this is not going to be a message that goes forward that is widely accepted that this entire this entire vision is that this is going to be a message that only a few are going to be able to initially give. Now, I, I've done a poor job explaining this vision. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit more that can be addressed with it. But Elder Jeff was very good in his application on this end. Yeah, now this was a vision that she didn't write down, right? It was one that was addressed by another party. Elder, Elder M. Johnson. Okay. So this is this is a vision that's been passed down. Um, uh, when in 198, while living in Loma Linda, near Sister White. Um, so this is Elder M. Johnson writing about another person who was there. Uh, Sister McKin McInterfer and Elder D. E. Robinson, her granddaughter's husband, 
Sister White related to the three of them about the storm of persecution that was to come upon Seventh-day Adventists. Um, this is the vision you're talking about? Yes. Sister White told us th that three stood there on the, us th three as we stood there on the platform, that a terrible storm of persecution was coming like a windstorm that blew down every standing object. There was not a Seventh-day Adventist to be seen. They, like the disciples, forsook Christ and fled. All who had sought positions were never seen again. After the storm, there was a calm. Then the Adventists seen. The Adventists arose like a great flock of sheep, but there were no shepherds. They all waited in earnest prayer for help and wisdom. And the Lord answered by helping them to choose leaders from among them who had never sought positions before. They prayed earnestly for the Holy Spirit, which was poured out upon them, making them fully ready for service. They then went forth, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners to give this message to the world. Now, on this fair as the moon, <clears throat> etc. Yeah. In, in looking at this one passage, I think it's it, it should be noted by all of us at this meeting today and those that will hear this later, that when you look at the words of this verse, mm -hmm. look carefully at the original word that is used for moon. Okay, so... Uh... Okay, what's the verse? Just a moment. I know I have it as a scripture song in Hebrew. Right. So if we're looking at that, uh, we're looking at Song of Solomon. Yeah. And would that be Song of Solomon, uh, either 6.4 or 6.10? Yeah, so 6-4, yeah, is going to be talking about uh, that, and 6-10, um, who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, or terrible as an army with banners. So there's two verses. Right. So in this situation, When you're looking at the words in this with Song of Solomon 6, 10. Yeah. The moon is Labana. It is white. Correct. Yeah. Now, there are multiple verses in the Bible that give reference to the moon, but there's only a very sl slim selection that would give reference to the white. Yeah, so Isaiah 24, 23, and Isaiah 30, 26. Okay, now, who is she? So this is the feminine of Hebrew 2089. So we're dealing with Hebrew 2063. Yeah. So who is she that looketh forth as the morning? that looketh forth as the dawn, fair as the moon, fair as the white, clear as the sun, <clears throat> we would have to look at this, and I humbly, I, I recommend that we look at this not as the S-U-N, but as the S-O-N, and terrible as an army with banners. You have the white, and you have the army with banners, and let us please remember that Sister White's maiden name was Harmon. Harmon is army man. Yeah. So my question and my thought, can, can this passage, as we look at this, with this prophecy, be giving reference to those that would give heed to the writings and admonitions of Sister White. Well, yeah. 
I, I, you could definitely make that application here. Um, so there, there's a lot there that we would have to look at. Um, but but I would think that this line of Gideon, so the basic, the basic idea that we have of Gideon is that this is a message about the judgments that are going to come upon the earth based upon the spirit of prophecy. And this, and this line is typical of what is going to happen. That is, what we experienced is not the actual events themselves. That is the main point that I've tried to explain to Colin, because he thinks we've ex we're experiencing in those events. But because he doesn't have a line, he just is is extending out, you know, this Nashville prediction of July 18. He's just saying, well, these things are being delayed. But they're being delayed within the line that we're in. But this line that we're in, that we're looking at, is not the big line. That is, we have not come to midnight yet in the line that Jeff has, right? Right, correct. And, and we know when, when we come to midnight, that in that line, you're gonna have midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law, in that line, that the Sunday law comes after the midnight cry. So you're gonna still have to have midnight, and then you're gonna have the joining of the two sticks, right? Then you're going to have the midnight cry, that proclamation about the Sunday law. Then the Sunday law will come, right? And that is something that happens within Adventism, right? There's, and when the Sunday law comes, we're going to have these other people join us prior to the Sunday law. That is, we're going to have people leaving the Adventist church and people joining the Adventist church, so to speak, right? Company after company is going to leave us. Tribe after lot, tribe is going to join us. Right. In that proclamation of when the Sunday law happens and the loud cry follows, we already have that group joining us that is going to be part of the 144,000. The ones who come in after the Sunday law, they will be martyrs. The vast majority of them. And then we have the close of probation. So on Ellen White's line, she has the Sunday law, the loud cry, the close of probation. She doesn't have the midnight and the midnight cry that precede them as part of her line. She does say, though, that the first and second angels messages need to be repeated. And so we're in that history that she's talking about. But it's not way marks on her line other than the Sunday law itself. But we know that what we're involved in right now is not that line. We're, we're involved in the arrival of the second angel on that line. We're not to midnight. And if we're not to midnight, I mean, in order for the Sunday law to come, we still have to have midnight and the midnight cry. And these are huge events. These aren't something that are just happening within our movement. These are happening worldwide within the Adventist church. And that hasn't happened yet. So we can't put the cart before the horse. We have to focus upon the light that's at our feet. We have to focus upon present duty. And the present duty right now given to this movement is to come together to the upper room, to be united so that we can accomplish the task that's before us. To just talk about that the Sunday law is going to come and not focusing upon the work that we have to do, that's peace and safety. Would you agree? I could not have said it better myself. So yes, I would agree. Yeah. And that's what we've been seeing as we've been studying. We recognize we are unprepared for the Sunday law. 
And if we're unprepared for the Sunday law, we're unprepared to give a message of warning regarding the Sunday law. So whether, you know, this whole movement comes becomes united and works together, that's not really our responsibility. Our responsibility is individually to be converted, to uh, seek to be united with our brethren, to not be caught up in speculations about other people's characters. Because we don't know. We just know what the message is. And we have to give that message and give that opportunity to meet together, to study together. If somebody refuses that opportunity, that, that responsibility lies upon them. We can't be separating from our brethren, thinking we're better than them. We have to seek to be united. Okay. So, <clears throat> any other final thoughts before we close in prayer? Because we are going to have to come back to this tomorrow to finish off this line. <laughs> hey, Stephen, you're very muffled. Okay, you're still really muffled. I can't hear what you're saying. You hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Okay. It's, um, I'm just saying, have you had any thoughts concerning uh, the 187 minutes that was connected to January 6th? Yes. 20, 20. Yeah, I actually have thoughts. I put it in my paper on... Um, uh, the siege of Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in my paper, let's see if I can open it up quickly. Um, so that paper is entitled, I can't remember the title of it. Okay. The Martyrdom of Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt. In that paper, I address this at the end, as I put it as uh, an addendum. Okay, so uh, four days after the events of January 6, 2021, we have a few more pieces of information to share. So I talk about when she was born, and, well, and then it's the next part, 187 minutes. On October 31, the Washington Post reported an unsupported claim made by the uh, January 6th committee that it took Trump 187 minutes to respond to the breaching of the Capitol building. It states, for 187 minutes, he resisted entreaties from advisors and lawmakers to intervene and tell his supporters to go, to, to go home. This claim, however, seems to be unfounded since it took him 25 minutes from the breaching of the Capitol building to respond with his first tweet. Nevertheless, this symbol being made in connection with the siege of Washington is significant in that it is a part of the narrative against Trump and is accepted as fact by many. And then I give one example of, of, of this. Uh, so I give a whole quote. Uh, so again, I say, we have the symbol for July 18 in the news in connection with January 6, 2021. Now, do you have any ideas about this, Stephen? I don't, um, but I'm just hearing you talking about it uh, in connection with this, this up, the applications of, uh, well, I hear you're talking about January the 6th in connection to the lines. I'm just wondering, would the 187 minutes have any impact upon these here lines you're thinking? Yeah, I would think so. So it, it shows that this symbol of 187 minutes, just like the 187 days, right, to January 6th, is this symbol attaching uh, this to, this whole line is about the significance of July 18th as a symbol of coming judgment. 
Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So thanks for bringing that up. That's an important point. Okay, so let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had here this morning in studying your word. Lord, we are so grateful for what you do in our lives, for the light that you have given us and the responsibility that you have entrusted to us, frail human beings. We dedicate our lives to you, Lord. We commit to you that we can cooperate with you in accomplishing this work upon the earth. Help us to set aside uh, the, the weights uh, that so easily beset us and to continue on this path. We pray for the people in Africa and around the world who are studying this message. We ask that you can strengthen them. And we know, Lord, that you're going to use uh, instruments of your choosing, not of man's choosing. We pray for this movement, that you can work upon our hearts and that you can show us our need of you. Help us to be committed uh, to you and to one another, to cooperate with each other. And we ask that you can continue to teach us and that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.